Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the main committee room, Parliament House Canberra. We, we meet here today where people have met for thousands of years and I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay my respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. I also extend that acknowledgement to any um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the audience today. This is the fifth in a series of annual lectures in honour of the late Harry Evans, Clerk of the Senate from 1988 to 2009. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to members of the Evans family who have joined us again for this occasion. I'd also like to recognise in the audience uh, Dr Rosemary Lang, who was Harry's successor as Clerk of the Senate, my predecessor. Um, Dr Lang gave last year's Harry Evans lecture. These lectures examine matters championed by Harry during his tenure as clerk, including the importance of the Senate as an institution, the rights of individual senators, and the value of parliamentary democracy. Today's lecturer is Andrew Murray, a senator for Western Australia from 1996 to 2008. Andrew has degrees in English and history from Rhodes University, South Africa, as well as degrees in philosophy, politics and economics from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. As a senator, Andrew was known as a champion of openness, accountability and budget transparency. His name, in fact, is attached to a 2001 Senate order which pierces the veil of commercial confidentiality on government contracts. The Murray motion ensures that details of such contracts are published online and thereby open to scrutiny. Technically, it's an order, but Murray motion has that alliteration that we, that we like. Similarly, the first presenter of the series of Harry Evans lectures, Michael Macklin, was associated with the Macklin motion, which is also an order, which requires legislation to sit on the table for a little while before the government tries to push it through the Senate. Other interests that Andrew was associated with in his time as a senator included putting forward an influential private senator's bill on public interest whistleblowing um, and appointments to government boards by merit selection. Andrew was also among a cohort of senators who profoundly influenced and were in turn profoundly influenced by a series of inquiries by the Senate's Community Affairs Committees on the treatment of children in institutional care. We have the secretary of those committees here today. He took this experience with him when he was appointed a commissioner for the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Abuse from 2013 to 2017. A businessman, academic, former senator and royal commissioner, his topic today, the Senate, the struggle continues. Please welcome Andrew Murray. Uh, friends, distinguished guests, uh, Rosemary, Richard, um, I recognise some faces. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, my thanks to the clerk uh, for asking me to deliver this annual Harry Evans lecture. I, I do consider it an honour, which is why I've travelled a long way to deliver it. Former clerk Harry Evans was a wonderful man, and I admired him enormously. We hit it off because we were both parliamentarians. Harry emphasised the vital importance of the Senate to the health and integrity of our democracy. He fearlessly and sometimes fiercely promoted the Senate as an institution. He knew that there is a continuing need to defend, explain, promote and advance the cause of the Senate, not just because of its vital national constitutional and democratic role, but because of the forces opposing it. The Senate is an integrity institution. I first thought of the Senate in those terms some years ago when I read a paper by former New South Wales Chief Justice, James Spiegelman. 
on what he called the distinct institutionally separate integrity branch of government. Spiegelman identified the committees of parliament, audit officers, independent corruption commissions, royal commissions and ombudsmen as fulfilling an integrity function. To attract legitimacy and trust, an integrity institution must itself have integrity, but it is more than just an institution that has integrity. An integrity institution has as its prime purpose an obligation to ensure that institutions, organisations or individuals over which it has oversight or power themselves operate with integrity. Paraphrasing Spiegelman, it must act to ensure that governmental institutions exercise the powers conferred on them in the manner in which it is expected and or required to do so and for the purposes for which those powers were conferred. I never heard Harry use the term integrity institution, but he knew that the Senate integrity role was hard won and it would have to continue to struggle to assert that role. The struggle is twofold. Firstly, for the Senate to retain the character of an integrity institution, complete with the support, legitimacy, trust and culture that such standing demands. Secondly, to counter the forces that continue to seek to de de delegitimize, deny, reduce or resist the powers and authority necessary to the functioning of the Senate as an effective integrity institution. Hence the title of this lecture, The Senate, The Struggle Continues. The title was prompted by my memory of the rallying cry used during the Mozambican War of Liberation, a luta continua, the struggle continues. It is natural for observers of the Senate to see it in the now and to judge it accordingly. It is also human nature to focus on its faults, not its strengths. The present matters, but it is the Senate's past that points the way to its future. The birth of the Senate was a struggle, but once given life and meaning by the Australian Constitution, its struggle thereafter has to been to grow stronger and to stay strong. The Senate's strength will always be tested because the Senate is in a competition for money and power. Its role is not to acquire it, but to guard and monitor it. The Senate's constitutional duty is to check or restrain others and often to encourage others in order to ensure the proper use of money and power. The struggles of the past and present have been for the Senate's independence, for the principles of accountability, transparency and responsibility and for the further advances needed in integrity. The constitutional framers intended the Australian Senate to be a necessary and powerful foil to the executive, the House of Representatives and the bureaucracy. The Senate's status as a powerful bicameral house with its own representational federal franchise stands on firm constitutional foundations with the central institutional check of ensuring that all legislation should have a double majority. Stanley Bach was right to say that ultimate legislative authority lies with the House, but the executive still has to get the numbers in the Senate. This is not a one-way street. The Senate in turn has to get the numbers in the House. Some believe the constitutional founders intended the Senate to be a house of review, but the constitution itself is silent on that point. However, the Senate had the powers to become one and review is now an absolutely vital part of its work. While the legislative and policy struggle between the houses is perennial, other Senate struggles since 1901 have been periodic. Getting the executive to agree, accept, reform or change does not come easily and resistance continues. Nevertheless, there have been tremendous strengthening advances for the Senate since 1901. These interlock but can be summarised as follows. Asserting and advancing independence from the executive, including through Senate reform. The 1949 introduction of proportional representation for Senate elections meant the governments thereafter found it hard to attain their own Senate majority. 
increasing the Senate's power and resources to make that independence meaningful. For instance, it now controls its own budget and has ready access to the expertise of the Parliamentary Library and the Parliamentary Budget Office. Effectively exercising power and restraining government from abuses or fault, principally through the committee system and the estimates hearings process. Insisting on scrutiny and review of legislation, delegated legislation and expenditure, this became more effective and enduring after standing committees were established. Introducing the use of discovery, particularly orders for the production of documents in the Murray motion, albeit limited by the invoking of executive privilege, restrictions on freedom of information requests and by secrecy orders. The accompanying power to call witnesses is powerful, but is constrained by an inability to call ministers from the House or ministerial advisers. The power of veto over delegated legislation enhanced by the restricted 10-year life of legislative instruments. Thoroughly investigating environmental, social, economic, and other national issues. Defending rights and freedoms and trying to avoid laws that unduly trespass on personal rights and liberties. Insisting on transparency, so making government and parliamentary processes and information open and accessible. Insisting that the executive, the bureaucracy, and the parliament itself are accountable and enforcing that accountability. Accountability accelerated following the 1970 introduction of a range of Senate standing committees and estimates public hearings. Making efforts to attend to integrity in office and function so that the parliament and its members stay true to purpose and exhibit honesty, trustworthiness, fairness and ethics in conduct and performance. Let us put our Senate into a larger context. Ideology is a system of ideas and ideals governing political theory and practice. That definition makes democracy itself an ideology. As a form of government and politics, democracy compete with other systems and ideologies. To survive competition, to survive attack, you have to defend and thrive. Competition can be deadly. Wars are the worst of it. In the first five decades following Federation in Australia, there were two world wars and the Great Depression to contend with, surges in authoritarian sentiment, attractions to the extremes of various isms, including racism, communism, and fascism, and internally, a serious campaign for succession in Western Australia. The next five decades were calmer, but still with war, periodic bouts of turmoil, and challenges to our peace, security, and prosperity. There have always been anarchists, terrorists, radicals, reactionaries, and revolutionaries living within democracies, including ours, whose societal effect is greater than their numbers and is occasionally catastrophic. There have always been those who hanker after a winner-takes-all approach, the tyranny of the majority, assailing the very foundation of successful democracy, which is to accommodate opposing opinions and interests. Defence is needed against these various assaults. Thriving socially and economically counters democracy's critics. Institutional integrity considerably helps that thriving. Australia is invariably and correctly described as a liberal democracy, albeit not a perfect one. Liberal democracy's ideological strength and health has been bolstered firstly by its successful absorption of the theories and practices of other appealing ideologies, for instance, conservatism, socialism, and liberalism, and secondly, by what it provides its adherents, freedom and rights, prospects and prosperity, welfare and well-being. Many more people live in the world under alternative systems of rule than under a liberal democracy. There are illiberal democracies by the dozen, theocracies, dictatorships, monarchies, and systems born of oppressive ideologies like communism. A threat to democracy does come from those who actively seek other systems of rule or government, 
and from those who are disengaged, an increasing trend. One survey has it, and I find this amazing, that one in three Australians think that in some circumstances a non-democratic government can be preferable or it doesn't matter what kind of government we have. Defence of democracy requires a forthright assertion of its values. In a 1966 speech in decidedly illiberal and only partially democratic South Africa, Robert Kennedy gave an impassioned defence of the freedom of speech, of protest and the press. He said, the enlargement of liberty for individual human beings must be the supreme goal and the abiding practice of any Western society. The essential humanity of men can be protected and preserved only where government must answer not just to the wealthy, not just to those of a particular religion or a particular race, but to all of its people. With less passion but equal force, Justice Sumption said in his 2019 BBC lectures that there are two essential and fundamental human rights, the right to a basic measure of security to life, liberty and property, and the right to freedom of expression, assembly and association. We are surely all aware of how strong the attacks are on these essential rights and freedoms in Australia and elsewhere in the democratic world. By its design and purpose, the Senate can deal with legislation and significant issues with integrity, meaning that it should do so on a well-informed, independent base, basis, honestly and with consistency. The committee system encourages cross-party participation and cooperation, a great virtue in any democratic system. There are pressures that affect our parliament and how it conducts itself. In turn, it challenges the Senate's ability to steer the steady institutional and democratic course required of it. For instance, countering terrorists or malicious foreign powers is not just costly, but results in unfortunately necessary restrictions on our freedoms and rights. Governments and bureaucrats will sometimes push the limits on those restrictions. It is the Senate that is needed to ensure those restrictions do not go too far. More broadly, others less violent or dangerous seek to erode our freedoms and rights when they assail academic freedom and free speech to assert other values. The Senate must not be passive on those fronts. Strong criticism and distaste for democratic parliaments and governments can be generated by fear and frustration. The Senate has an essential role in using reasoned argument to deal with these. In my 20s, long time ago, there was widespread and justified concern about the danger of nuclear war, the threat of communism, and the Club of Rome's predictions. For a minority, those concerns morphed into apocalyptic fears. We see the same happening today on climate. A source of strong criticism arises from the frustration felt by particular groups who feel their problems and issues are not being adequately addressed. Then there is the criticism that has many supporters, those authoritarians who want the political party in power to prevail without a Senate check, the get out of our way and let us govern mob. <clears throat> the philosopher John Rawls saw one of the roles of political philosophy as to discover grounds for reasoned agreement in a society where sharp divisions threaten to lead to conflict. In my view, that is best done when democracy flourishes, freedom of speech and thought prevails, where integrity and in conduct is a given, where respect is shown for persons and arguments, and where the minority is represented and is not oppressed or disadvantaged. It is also best done when issues of concern to the populace are seriously and competently addressed by parliaments and governments. <coughs> Rawls said another role of political philosophy is probing the limits of practicable political possibility, achieving enduring and workable political arrangements, 
and allowing for reconciliation to calm our frustration and rage against our society. One of the great virtues of liberal democratic systems is that it internalizes its critics. They are represented within its political class. The integrity of the Senate is displayed when those competing tensions are successfully accommodated. Structure or institutional integrity means holding together and preserving its function without it breaking or deforming. It is self-evident that helping ensure our democratic structure does not break or deform requires the Senate itself to retain and indeed enhance its institutional integrity. Professor Charles Samford writes that a national integrity system encapsulates the interconnecting institutions, laws, procedures, practices, and attitudes that promote integrity and reduce the likelihood of corruption in public life. He also argues that integrity systems are a form of risk management. The institutional integrity of the Senate rests on the Australian constitution and constitutional law, supported by such instruments as the Parliamentary Privileges Act and Senate rules, precedents, practice, conduct, and culture. The maintenance of Senate institutional integrity is not solely a matter for senators. It depends on the culture, conduct, behavior, and values of senators, the clerk, and Senate departmental staff, and the other members of the political class, which include the media, working in parliament. The integrity of an institution does not require everyone who is a part of it to have integrity, but it does require most to have integrity. It particularly requires leaders to have integrity. Individual integrity must be present to preserve institutional integrity. Individual integrity requires individuals to be honest and truthful in their dealings and true to their values. It does not require people to be perfect, but being imperfect does not excuse bad conduct or shrill censoriousness and absolutism or insisting on conformity of their choosing. Such conduct offends the essence of the fair go and live and let live doctrine that allows for democratic tolerance and compromise. Having said that, the passion, humanity, imperfection and variety our democratic representational system throws up is to be celebrated. Totalitarian or conformist systems do not allow that. Institutional and individual integrity affects faith and trust in our political system. Faith and trust is essential to ongoing support for our liberal democracy and to avoid criticism moving to disaffection. Trust in our democratic institutions is often thought to be at a low ebb. There are current reports of less respect within modern democracies for democracy itself and its institutions. Yet there's recent uh, research by the Lowy Institute on attitudes that indicates that Australians have a huge appetite to reboot and to renew their democracy. Australians as a whole want to be assured that their political class and political institutions will keep them safe and secure, uphold the rule of law, preserve their rights and their freedoms, address issues of concern, and competently advance their prospects and well-being, and will behave in a manner that befits their office. How do Australians regard institutional and individual integrity in politics? In politics, there are intangibles, such as the reputation, standing, and sense of worth a nation and its institutions enjoy. The intangibles are of great importance to the Australian people looking at the parliament and making judgments on its integrity and culture. It may be very unfair, but a relatively common view on the streets and in the media seems to be that the political class are self-interested, untrustworthy liars, with the exception of the ones they know personally who are surprisingly nice people. I believe Australians once distinguished the conduct of individuals from the reputation of institutions. So the parliament was more respected than the politician and the media more than the journalist. Institutions in general seem to be more on the nose now. How can that be otherwise when banks debit the dead and churches protect paedophiles? 
We live completely different lives to our ancestors, but human nature has not changed. Human nature can, however, be corralled within power and societal, societal structures and be guided by society's customs, culture, and what is regarded and accepted as acceptable behavior. Right from the start, rules and laws have sought to curb the worst in us. The simple list of 10 commandments has expanded every century until we get to today's criminal code, buttressed by myriad laws, codes of conduct, and rules. The best in us has never needed much rule and law and freely exhibits itself daily in individuals and in institutions that act with integrity. Non-democratic systems give power and control to an elite and rule and law is oppressive. Democracy is intended to give power and control to the people. Our democratic system is based on the rule of law delivered through legitimate and widely accepted decision-making processes and on power controlled by institutional checks and balances. Having said that, we must remember that bicameralism is one of those controls and is designed to provide a powerful check on government. Why is it, when we're all drawn from the same human pot, that surveys show that those in the health and teaching professions are highly regarded and those in media and politics are not? The Roy Morgan image of profession survey 2017 is instructive. Nurses were rated as high or very high at 94 out of 100. Ministers of religion and bank officials at a terrible 34 and 33. And journalists, union leaders and federal MPs at an awful 20, 17 and 16 out of 100 respectively. It is unlikely that better human beings than the rest of us populate nursing and teaching professions, or that individuals in those professions have intrinsically greater integrity and higher standards than individuals in other occupations. The answer to the wide gulf between high and low regard must lie partly in the very different nature of the work being done in each profession, partly in the different laws, rules, and standards that apply to each, and particularly in the different ethics and culture in each. Nevertheless, we should heed current concerns. Public distaste for the standards of conduct in democratic politics makes it harder for defenders of the virtues of democracy. Former British Prime Minister Theresa May is reported to have said that vile abuse and perpetual strife was corroding democratic values in British politics and around the world. Her remarks reflect distress at a decline in the value placed on professional standards, courtesy and civility in parliamentary and public discourse. Lord Sumption remarks that there is a mounting tide of hostility to representational politics. Paul Kelly reports that Professor Jonathan Haidt believes that the liberal, multicultural, secular model of Western politics is not a natural phenomenon for human beings and that there is a very good chance that American democracy will fail. Does it matter that journalists and members of parliament are so poorly regarded? Perceptions and the judgment of the political class and of political institutions are derived from experience and observation. Those who lie or exaggerate greatly to further their cause, which is a common fault, or, do who, or who do not act in the public interest, or who hide, conceal, or deceive, or who are incompetent, make Australians fearful, nervous, insecure, and untrusting, and damn the reputations of other politicians and the parliamentary institution as a whole. It is particularly an issue when leaders of the political class behave in this way. These are not new issues. In 1992, the Royal Commission into Commercial Activities of Government and Other Matters in Western Australia reported, ministers have elevated personal or party advantage over their constitutional obligation to act in the community's interests. Public funds have been manipulated to partial ends. Personal associations and the manner in which electoral contributions were obtained could only create the public impression that favour could be bought, that favour would be done. 
Nevertheless, without diminishing justified concerns with significant national shortcomings and failures, overall Australia is a well-off, peaceful, enlightened, progressive liberal democracy operating under a fair rule of law. It is protected by universal suffrage, strong political institutions and high standards of governance. That being said, Australia's political culture and political integrity needs improving and the principles and freedoms of a liberal democracy need stronger defending. In 2017, a Senate Select Committee usefully reviewed integrity initiatives and integrity institutions. These initiatives seem to have had little effect yet on parliamentary culture and conduct or to have changed media and public opinion of senators and members. The committee recommended the parliament appoint a parliamentary integrity commissioner to provide advice on matters of ethics to senators and members. There's always been a need to address a parliamentary and party culture that will tolerate slippery standards and conduct. Many resist efforts to improve their conduct. I remember what, it what a struggle it was for me to get the first ever audit done on parliamentary entitlements in 100 years. Of course, no integrity measure works if it is not reported and enforced and if the punishment is inadequate. As an example, integrity requires a senator to be true to their conscience. The senator rules state that a person shall not by fraud, intimidation, force or threat of any kind or by other improper means influence a senator in the senator's conduct as a senator. If anyone thinks senators have not been threatened with losing pre-selection to pull them into line, they're living on another planet. The 2017 Select Committee on the National Integrity Commission recommended more diligence in privileges committees and on breaches of ministerial standards. As far as I can see, things have not improved on either front. Following are a few matters that would contribute to the integrity of the Senate as a vital national integrity institution. Incremental improvement taken together should, I don't say will, should make a difference. In 2018, the government announced it will establish an independent statutory Commonwealth Integrity Commission to strengthen integrity uh, arrangements across the public sector and detect, deter and investigate corrupt conduct. That is a good thing. In my independent 2008 report, undertaken at the request of the Finance Minister, I recommended that the government establish a public sector regulator, equivalent to, but is not as costly as, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, which is the private sector regulator. I doubt whether that function can be incorporated into the proposed National Integrity Commission or into the Public Service Commission. Despite further improvements in public sector governance, such as the introduction of independent audit committees, I remain of the view that a public sector regulator is worth considering. Democracy is itself a safeguard on character. If elected politicians are later found to lack integrity and to have weak principles, they will be subject to scrutiny by our free press and to the judgment of voters. But that is after the event. At the outset, can we improve the functioning and integrity of political parties that select candidates, and can we improve the ability of the voters to make informed choices? Who becomes a senator is vital because it is senators who guard the Senate's integrity, determine Senate activity and decide contested legislation. It is obviously preferable that a vote is an informed one. That becomes harder in a multi-party, multi-candidate system. Below the line voters select Senate candidates and not political parties. Senate elections produce very large numbers of contesting candidates registered political parties and registered groups. Try looking up Senate candidates to assess their attributes. It is impossible, even on the established parties' websites. In the nomination process, the Australian Electoral Commission should be provided with a minimum profile of each candidate that it publishes on its website. More important is reform of the money flow in politics, both direct and indirect. Politics is the contest of interests, ideas and commitments, inevitably to be realised through money and power. 
The possession or desire for money and or power can corrupt morals and affect personal integrity. There are also those so impassioned by their cause that they conclude that the end justifies any means. That is why those who desire or possess and use money and or power in our political system need restraint to be watched and held to account, as do the unscrupulous. I have campaigned at length in the past on political donations and refer you to that work. I was delighted to see one of my long campaigns on outlawing foreign donations finally realised in 2016. I continue to be alarmed by the system and nature of political donations. The law as it stands permits some political parties to seek to rise to power or influence outcomes on the strength of political advertising and fake news that is fraudulent. A lax attitude to truthfulness fosters a culture within political circles that regards deception as simply part of the political game, rather than the serious attack on the integrity of the political system that it is. The private sector is already required by law not to engage in misleading or deceptive conduct by Section 18 of Australian Consumer Law. The Commonwealth Electoral Act should be amended to prohibit inaccurate or mis misleading statements of fact in political advertising, which is likely to deceive or mislead. Such advertising has long been outlawed in South Australia, and the Commonwealth should follow suit. Political governance is weak. In a 2009 paper, I asked the question, can better political governance give Australia an improved political class. Improving the internal governance arrangements of political parties will help strengthen the institutional integrity of parliament and could even improve parliamentary culture. Political governance includes how a political party operates, how it is managed, its corporate and other structures, the provisions of its constitution, how it resolves disputes and conflicts of interest, its ethical culture and its level of transparency and accountability. The Commonwealth Electoral Act should be amended to require standard items to be set out in a political party's constitution to gain registration, similar to the requirements under corporations law for the constitution of companies. Party constitutions should be required to specify the conditions and rules of party membership, how office bearers are pre-selected and selected, how pre-selection of candidates is conducted, the processes for the resolution of disputes and conflicts of interest, processes for changing the constitution and the processes for administration and management. Party constitutions should also provide for the right of members in specified classes of membership to take part in the conduct of party affairs, either directly or through freely chosen representatives to freely express choices about party matters, including the choice of candidates for elections and to exercise a vote of equal value with a vote of any other members in the same class of membership. Party constitutions should be subject or should be open to public scrutiny on the internet. Then there is section 44 of the constitution. Section 44 has been a major problem for decades, but the costly and distracting mayhem during the last parliament was unprecedented and it annoyed Australians no end. The two most contentious paragraphs of section 44 state that the person who holds or is eligible for dual citizenship cannot nominate as a candidate and serve in parliament, and an employee in the public sector must resign their employment to nominate for election. Section 44 has been the subject of multiple inquiries and recommendations, again addressed in 2018 by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. JSCM reported that Section 44 is, quote, no longer operating to effectively ensure its principal intent of parliamentary integrity and national sovereignty, and it acts as a deterrent for many Australians who are considered actively participating in po politics. Shockingly, the committee estimated that over half of all Australians would have barriers to nomination under Section 44.1 because 46% of the population were born overseas, and 8% would have barriers to nomination under paragraph four, because 
they work in the public sector. The committee believed that sections 44 and 45 should be repealed in their entirety or amended to mirror section 34 and include until the parliament otherwise provides. Now we know that only one in five referendums succeed. I'm not a pessimist about either of those committee propositions passing, but given public distrust of the political class, it would be wise for a draft bill to be drawn up beforehand so that Australians can see exactly what replacement legislation would propose as barriers and qualifications for sitting as a member or senator, particularly with respect to the issues of conflicts of interest. Our laws have four components, the primary legislation, delegated or subordinate legislation that flows from the primary legislation, the bureaucratic rules, standards, practices and institutions that, that accompany its administration, and any jurisprudence that is provoked by the primary or delegated law. It is not just the law that requires examination, but the cost it carries with it. The Senate's legislation committees, in considering estimates of proposed annual expenditure, perform an essential job in examining new appropriations and programs, and at my initiative, the annual tax expenditure statement. Recently, there's been a determination to address expenditure via delegated legislation, which by itself is half of all federal law by volume. For significant long-standing legislation that has no termination date and or large annual expenditures, formal periodic review is needed. In my 2008 report undertaken at the request of the Finance Minister, I recommended that the government include sunset clauses in all future standing appropriations and legislation. This has not happened. Special or standing appropriations are in Acts of Parliament other than the annual appropriation acts and continue for longer than the financial year, sometimes forever. Approximately 70 to 80% of all government expenditure is of that nature. Little consideration is given as to whether standing appropriations and existing or proposed bills are appropriate in the longer term. A manageable and workable selective review of significant ongoing legislation and its standing appropriation needs to be devised by the Senate or be delegated by it. No appropriation should be forever. With some exceptions, sunsetting to 25 years might be the appropriate standard. There is a precedent for sunsetting. Most legislative instruments or delegated legislation are automatically repealed 10 years after registration. Bringing past legislation into a sunsetting regime would need to be staggered and attended to each year. It would take 10 years to review, clean up or insert sunset clauses into most existing standing operation, appropriations. In theory, the presence of political parties and members of the government in the Senate should fatally undermine the prospects of it acting effectively as an integrity institution. That is because the possibility of political parties gaining advantage or benefit, or of senators gaining personal advancement or benefit, or higher office, or of using their position to advance partisan or personal interests, all produce a conflict of interest. At times, political parties have been able to use their place in the Senate to advantage. But to assert that a demonstrated conflict of interest exists for individuals and that it is common is wrong. In practice, the record shows that over the decades, senators as a whole have done their duty and fulfilled their constitutional obligation and role. Resolving or managing actual and potential conflicts of interest is undoubtedly greatly assisted by regular elections, public and media scrutiny, transparency and accountability, the combativeness of opposing parties, and the values and integrity of individual senators. One area where conflict of interest has triumphed over integrity is in appropriations for the ordinary annual services of government. The Senate Appropriation and Staffing Committee has long railed against impropriety here, 
and the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee comments that inappropriate classification continues to undermine the Senate's constitutional functions. Parties large enough to form government have united to ensure that new expenditure on new programs can still masquerade as the ordinary annual services of government. In 2018, responding to unsuccessful amendments to the appropriations bills to reclassify policy items as new expenditure, the Coalition and Labor both restated their support for an executive compact that supports the current flawed classification. I am one among a number over the decades that have tried to deal with this matter, but apart from achieving some significant remedial housekeeping of redundant appropriations, I too failed. In my 2008 report to the Finance Minister, I wrote, the constitutional imperative is governed by two constitutional provisions. Section 83, appropriation must be made by law, and Section 53, restricting the powers of the Senate to amend bills imposing taxation or providing for the ordinary annual services of the government. A corollary of these provisions is that an appropriation bill not for the ordinary annual service of the government may be directly amended by the Senate. In addition, Section 54 provides that an appropriation bill for the ordinary annual service of the government must contain only those appropriations. I wrote then that the executive's abuse of these sections is a direct challenge by the executive to the unambiguous intention of the Australian Constitution. In a paper in 2017, Anne Twomey took up the vexed question of an eternally slippery executive using authorised appropriations and expending them contrary to the purpose of the original proposal. Perhaps it's time for the Senate to resolve that appropriations are approved for the purposes and in the manner envisaged at the time of parliamentary authorisation and for no other purpose. However, the High Court decisions in Wilkie and Combe mean that the only way to enforce compliance with the constitutional intent has to be through prescriptive legislation. A Senate resolution will not suffice, but perhaps as a first step, it will stiffen the Senate's back somewhat. The government response to part of my recommendations to the Minister of Finance noted that the government will consider including formal review clauses in special appropriation legislation, requiring governments to review and report to Parliament on a periodic basis on the continuing need for the legislation and whether the existing focus of the legislation remains valid. A decade later, it seems that no such review clauses have been included in new standing appropriation provisions. I will conclude in this way. Our institutions uh, are under threat. If you look at the media and the disregard the community have for them, at politics, at the church, at our great commercial corporations, all of those are regarded as having real integrity issues. Probably only the courts at present stand apart from such an attitude. So integrity is an issue that has to be attended to by everyone uh, who's concerned to ensure that our great liberal democracy uh, strengthens. And in my view, it is the Senate that has to carry much of that fight. In this lecture, I have tried to put the Senate in context as an institution to give a broad perspective on the issues and to propose a select list of advances that need to be made in the interests of integrity and democracy. The Senate's ongoing struggle to effectively serve Australia will and must continue. E luta continua. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we do have time for some uh, some questions. You'll see microphones in the uh, uh, corridor down here, and a, an, another one um, up in the gallery. And we have a question in the gallery. I'll I'll do what people always do at every public lecture in the country and um, 
request that any comments that you have are very brief and that you focus on questions for our guests today. Please. Thanks. Uh, my question's to do with the structural budget figures that with the Charter of Budget Honesty that was introduced um, a while ago, they used to include the structural budget figures that gave you a true estimate of the state of the, bu of the budget. And then those were discontinued um, under Wayne and Wayne Swan and Kevin Rudd. And in frustration, I think the Parliamentary Budget Office prior to the 2007 election put out a paper under the leadership of Phil Bowen where they actually clearly stated what the structural budget figures were and showed that the finances were not nearly as strong as the government was claiming. I would think that um, the Senate would be very interested in having those structural budget figures reinstated, particularly if you're worried about people having concerns about forward budget estimates to do with expenditure. And I was wondering if you had any comments about that. Thanks. Um, you heard me. <coughs> excuse me. You heard me earlier say that human nature has not changed and does not change. Essentially, those with money and power always want on, to hang on to it and will not want to give it up, and don't like uh, having controls over what they can do with their money and their power. Now, that's the essential problem underlying all these debates. In my 2008. Uh, uh, report, I made recommendations to the Joint Standing Committee on uh, uh, accounts that they review the Charter of Budget Honesty because you continually need to update it to address the ways in which people will try and get round it, which is what you're discussing, basically. So to attack that <clears throat> does not require a speech in the Parliament or a, a set of questions at estimates because that won't solve the problem. You actually need to enforce it through principles or rules which you establish through the Charter of Budget Honesty. So uh, my view is that if people are serious about that, they have to take it to a committee which has standing, which can review it properly, and can produce an outcome which will change matters permanently. It was good to have it for a while. I have a question down here, I think. Competition for the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for the argument of um, uh, the Senate's role as an integrity institution. I've long wanted to see the Senate enjoy a greater reputation, a higher status in the community, uh, whereas we get a lot of diversions about uh, negotiating from day to day. I would like your views on the potential, the unrealised potential of the Senate to be not just a house of review, but a house where debates can be highlighted and can help, help to resolve long-standing, um, difficult, devilish issues like climate change. Both houses declined to pass resolutions stating that there is a climate change emergency. Now, there's been a debate now for 20 or 30 years. You mentioned the word apocalyptic. Cannot the Senate help in lifting public debate on such difficult issues? The short answer is yes. Um, and I refer you to the great uh, American liberal philosopher, John Rawls, who I quoted as saying, uh, as outlining the importance of reasoned argument in resolving issues of great conflict and controversy. Um, uh, the difficulty we have with great debates such as the matter you refer to is that there are those so impassioned by their cause at either ends that they exaggerate the issues and therefore lose the confidence of the people in uh, what they say. So uh, the case for reasoned argument um, and for uh, debate which informs is one in which the Senate can help. Um, it may be an odd transference, but I refer you uh, to the report we did on uh, in children in institutions. 
long before that, there were attempts to push those issues under the carpet to suppress uh, those matters. Uh, what the Senate inquiries did was to bring forward, if you like, reasoned argument about what had happened, what the issues were and what their consequences were, which eventually led on to the Royal Commission on which I sat. Um, the Senate can take matters of great importance to the Australian people or of great importance to Australia and can indeed uh, make a huge difference. Um, it depends on the nature of the people there, uh, on their capacity uh, to persuade. Uh, and um, I think if we can improve the variety uh, and um, uh, range, I suppose, of senators, we might see an advance such as you want. Senator, in your uh, discussion about integrity and the low integrity with which many of our institutions are held, in reference to uh, politicians, you said of the enormous difficulty you had in conducting an audit over a long period of time about travel entitlements. <coughs> Excuse me. Why has it been so difficult to achieve uh, a system of rules and regulations which governs and prevents the abuse of, of travel by federal politicians when in the public service I think the scope is much less uh, and the evidence is that it's, it's not widespread as is the case in the private sector. If I could just cite one instance of where uh, many years ago a West Australian senator came to Queensland where I lived at the time uh, and gave an address to a party that was not his own <clears throat> but on a topic that meant a lot to him and he said to the audience that I'm really not entitled to come here and have the taxpayer pay for it. But he said, the rules are so loose that I do it because everyone else does it and it'll continue to happen. <coughs> okay. um, I come back to a central theme. Yeah, human nature does not change. So where people have uh, a set of rules and arrangements that benefit them or benefit the institutions they serve. And by the way, there's a very interesting thesis by a political scientist um, called Tham, T-H-A-M, uh, who says that Australia is not individually corrupt, but institutionally corrupt, which is quite, quite a, an interesting thesis. Um, uh, people don't want to have that interfered with. It interferes with their freedom of operation. Uh, we all know that self-regulation is dangerous. Uh, you know, that's why legislation has been introduced so that there isn't self-regulation. But wherever that applies, you have uh, difficulties. It is no accident that of all the mighty forces in the society, and I use the word mighty deliberately, because politics, of course, governs our lives, our laws, our policy, the funds uh, we raise, the funds we spend. It is no accident that of all the mighty forces that exist in Australia, the least constrained by regulation, law and control is politics. Uh, it's why I, I attend to the issue of political governance. Um, so it, it just requires uh, long-term campaigning by those who want integrity, which, by the way, includes many people within the political parties themselves. There are plenty of people who would argue exactly as you argue for more integrity on in these matters. But the few always affect the many. There's another point I'll make about human nature doesn't matter if you are a judge or a grave digger, there's a percentage of humanity who will do the wrong thing. <laughs> and, you know, the, the three or five politicians who do the wrong thing affect the other 221 that don't. Time for one more question. Thanks. I'll try and make it quick. Uh, with uh, regard to the Brexit at the moment, and our uh, history really comes from you know, the, the UK, uh, how is that going to influence us at the moment where you know, they're ignoring a uh, yeah, a national referendum or pleb plebiscite. Uh, second thing, who really, at the end of the day, does the ABC answer to when they, they can influence an election quite dramatically and they get into bed with a get up and organisations like this? And um, just like to hear your comments about free speech. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I need now for all that. Um, uh, 
just briefly, I don't think democracy should only express itself in one way, namely through elections. So the Swiss very effectively use uh, uh, referenda in defined circumstances, and plebiscites are, are really an expression of the people's voice without being attached to a legislative uh, intention. Uh, so I do support uh, plebiscites and referenda on a popular basis. And by the way, Australia is well served by having compulsory attendance at the polls, because if Britain had had compulsory attendance at their polls, I wonder if their plebiscite would have been a lot different. Uh, so that, that's one thing. Uh, on the ABC, I, I simply say to you, a national broadcaster has only two um, reasons to exist, either for propaganda purposes or because there's market failure. So you make uh, uh, your views uh, surrounding that. Um, uh, there is market failure. Uh, in certain respects in, in the communications market. Uh, there is a need for propaganda, namely with respect to our uh, voice in the Pacific, uh, the broader Pacific. Um, but those are the only two reasons you should ever look at having a national uh, uh, broadcaster. Uh, the third matter was? Freedom of speech. Well, here we are. <laughs> here we are. I'm all for it. I cannot abide the attacks on academic freedom of free and free speech. The very best decision that Australians made uh, way back in the 40s and 50s was not to ban the Communist Party, because those idiots could only be exposed if they were given more and more license to speak freely. Uh, you know, don't, don't suppress voices you disagree with. Let them speak, because the populace at large will just see them for the fools they are. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, for your presentation today, charting the, the history and development of the Senate as an integrity institution and giving us some, some uh, ways to chart the way forward. I, I um, personally am very grateful for the lecture because it's going straight into the induction program for new Senate staff. Um, but if you would all like to join me in thanking our presenter today, Andrew Murray. Thank you all.